We are joined today by Noam Chomsky and Vijay Prashad to talk about their book, The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of U.S. Power. It's re really clear throughout the book that the terms are set by the United States, the conversation is set by the United States, and the military and economic interventions serve as internal and external discipline. So they are externally disciplining anybody who dares, you know, break or deviate from any of the rules set out at any moment. And they're internally disciplining, you know, allies in other countries who generally follow along, but it's showing constantly the might of the United States and what happens if you step a toe out of line. Um, speaking to what you were saying with the China threat, uh, this has recently been in the news because of Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, and I'd like both of you to comment on that. But you also talk about in the book um, about the way that China is trying to create systems that can meet or match or um, in some way contest U.S. power, and that's both economic um with the um, Belt and Road Initiative. You talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China has been doing development in Africa. And from what I've read in the mainstream news, the line is the Chinese don't mind working with corrupt leaders. So they're fine to you know build these um, infrastructure projects down there. But this seems like it gets to part of the core of the idea of the China threat. and. There has been in the last week or so some escalating tensions. Can you talk about Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and more generally, um, what is the threat from China? Is it an alternative um, global banking system like the SWIFT system? Is it a way of checking U.S. sanctions? Is it a way of checking U.S. military power? Can you speak to that? Well, with regard to Pelosi, uh, this was a very reckless uh, act of uh, personal aggrandizement. She's obviously trying to beef up her CV and show that she can be as tough as the craziest lunatic male that you can find. There was no other reason for it. And for 50 years, there's been a basic agreement about Taiwan. It's called the One China Policy. It's agreed that China's part of Taiwan's part of China, and that uh, China and the United States will stay in a state of strategic ambiguity, as it's called. Uh, they tacitly agree that neither of them will do anything to overthrow the status quo by force. Okay, that's kept uh, for 50 years of peace, a few breaks. Uh, very successful policy. Uh, in recent years, the United States has been increasing provocations, uh, which China responds to. Uh, same in this case, uh, Pelosi's visit was a major provocation. Uh, China didn't shoot down our plane as they could have. They simply responded by a demonstration that China can close off Taiwan blockade it uh, so that it will uh, it, they will strangle it. It's, just, it's a trading, it's a rock in the ocean, it lives on trade. Uh, China surrounds it with military force, it's stuck, it'll collapse. So China carried out military maneuvers showing that. Uh, they also uh, pr uh, imposed some sanctions on Taiwan and also breaks with the United States, simply to show we're not going to be pushed around. Now, the sanctions are probably more serious than they look. So one of the things that China uh, imposed was apparent, we don't have all details, but it seems that they imposed a ban on export of sand to Taiwan. Well, that doesn't sound like much until you think for a minute. Uh, sand, uh, uh, Taiwan's a rock. If they want to build something, they need concrete. Concrete is based on sand. Uh, 
So China saying, well, you fool around, we can undercut your economy uh, very easily. We don't have to invade. Uh, that's basically the message. Now we have to recognize that the US provocations go way beyond Taiwan. Uh, the United States recently has been running a huge naval operation, multinational naval operation, RIMPAC it's called, with uh, all threatening China in the Pacific, major operations. Uh, the US has established what it calls a, a, a sentinel states to, to encircle China, uh, hostile states run by the United States. Uh, uh, Biden provided precision weapons, which hadn't been there before, to be able to target China. Uh, U.S. nuclear submarines have the capacity to destroy China, in fact, the world, uh, but uh, they're all surrounding it. The, there's an agreement with Australia, which one of Australia's leading strategic analysts called uh, Clinton Fernandez called a sub-imperial country, which serves U.S. power in the as a base for U.S. power in the region. There's a deal to provide uh, the Alka deal. It's called provide Australia with nuclear submarines, which can seriously threaten China in the South China Sea. Claim to be able to just sink its fleet if they want to uh, monitor Chinese operations there. Uh, the Quad, so it's called, is uh, um, South Korea and Japan, Aust Aust no, Australia, Japan, United States, and India. India is a reluctant partner, doesn't want to participate in this game. But uh, the idea is to surround and circle China with hostile powers, which will prevent it from breaking out, doing anything. Now, that's constant severe threats. Uh, what's the threat of China? Uh, I think it's what I said before. They're there. Actually, the most former Australian Prime Minister, Paul Keating, well-known international statesman, had an article in the Australian press asking what actually is the threat of China? What are we worried about? He ran through the reasons and none of them make any sense. I said the real threat of China is China is there. It's there and it refuses to follow orders. Here, I think we can go back to the Godfather image. Take, say, Cuba. Why, why does the United States devote such extraordinary efforts to torture and destroy Cuba? I mean, there's no precedent for it in, in history, in fact. Like right now, China, Cuba has a huge fire. It's getting support from Mexico, from Venezuela, not the United States. You have to strangle and torture the Cubans. Well, we know the reason. I go back to State Department records in the 1960s, very explicit. The threat of Castro is his successful defiance of policies going back to the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, which stated the intention of the United States to dominate the hemisphere. Couldn't do it then, Britain was too strong, but they understood sooner or later the US would be able to do it. And in fact, in 1898, uh, the United States did intervene in Cuba, what's called here the liberation of Cuba, what in fact was the prevention of the liberation of Cuba from Spain. The US intervened to prevent it, turned Cuba into a virtual colony. As soon as Cuba broke out of that in 1959, attacks began. Since then, they've been carrying out successful denying, defiance. And the Godfather doesn't accept that. Doesn't matter whether there are any resources or not. Uh, just to and I had a comment on what Vijay said about you, uh, the Congo. My own feeling is even if the Congo hadn't had uranium, they still would have killed Lumumba because the Congo is the richest, most powerful part of Africa. If it 
succeeds in developing, it'll bring all Africa along with it. The US not having that. So Lubumba was, Lubumba, Lubumba was assassinated. The Belgian got their first, but CIA had him on their hit list. Then they installed a kleptomaniac murderer who would follow US orders, just to make sure that Congo doesn't move towards successful defiance or anybody else. Well, that's China. China is not going to be pushed around. They have several thousand years of history. They went through a century of humiliation, ended with the Maoist revolution. They're not going to accept it again. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a huge initiative of investment and development. You're quite right. They're perfectly willing to work with anyone, corrupt, non-corrupt, just build this system, which is China-based, includes most of Asia already, moving to Africa, even moving to Latin America, US backyard, US can't stop it, moving to the Middle East, even Israel. So China owns half the Haifa port. Well, US doesn't like it, but doesn't have the ability to stop it. The United Arab Emirates is a key to the Chinese what's called Maritime Silk Route, which reaches to the Red Sea onto the way of moving towards Europe, uh, which will probably want to join this. It's much too rich an area to avoid. China's just moving steadily, slowly, no violence, uh, investment, development. The US can't do anything about it, it's going crazy. It's part of the reason for the hysteria about China now. I mean, the hysteria is just beyond discussion. Uh, so it takes something like, uh, the United States is collapsing from within. We all know that. Uh, the bridges are collapsing, the subways don't work, nothing works, the health system doesn't work. So we need spending to rebuild the United States. Well, finally, Congress got together and did agree to a bill uh, for some construction of infrastructure, not because the United States needs bridges, because we have to outcompete China. It's the China competition bill. I mean, this is pathological, you know, but it shows what, when the Godfather's in trouble, he goes crazy. You know? Just to, again, build a little on what Noam was saying, First, I just want to say from a personal standpoint, um, you know, I, I think it's important for intellectuals, um, different kinds of people to interact with each other across all kinds of barriers. I, I've been a great proponent of interacting with people that one doesn't agree with. I think it's a, it's a good part of the human experience. So, you know, for the past, I don't know, decade, more than the past decade, I've developed very close relationships with intellectuals in China. I've held conversations with them. You know, I've spent time talking to Zhang Weiwei, leading intellectual. He was the translator of Deng Xiaoping. Um, spent a lot of time talking with somebody I deeply respect, Wang Hui, teaches at Tsinghua University and so on. These connections by themselves have for some people um, been a red rag to the bull because they claim that any contact with China is somehow uh, has you, you know, in fact, influenced by China as if, for instance, I don't have my own brain. Um, in other words, it goes back to a debate from an earlier period when George W. Bush, borrowing from Samuel Huntington, you know, began to use the kind of clash of civilizations rhetoric um, hyped up between Christianity and Islam at the time. Now we're seeing a kind of clash of civilizations rhetoric between the so-called West and Russia, China and so on. You know, at the time when George Bush began to talk in this clash of civilizations way, leading figures in Iran sent a letter to the United States government, in fact, directly to George W. Bush, where they said, rather than a clash of civilizations, 
Can't we have a dialogue across civilizations? Strikes me that um, many of the Western governments led by the United States have lost the appetite for both diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, strikes me that, you know, the demonization of people substitutes for a mature attitude toward them. Look, frankly, the United States knows that in many areas of economic life, high speed rail, green technology, even now some areas of computerization, certainly telecommunications, Chinese firms can produce goods as good as the United States, you know, as efficient as the United States, and of course, cheaper than US firms, even when US firms produce these goods in China. So Apple phones produced in China are much more expensive than Huawei phones. Rather than merely compete commercially, the United States has decided to utilize its diplomatic, military, and ideological force to intimidate China into stop developing its own technological capacity. And, you know, there used to be a familiar word for that, which nowadays doesn't get used in polite conversation much. The word for that was imperialism. You know, you're using extra economic force to gain advantages. Why can't the United States get its act together, produce better phones, produce better technology at a cheaper price, produce green technology. Why can't it just compete with China, you know, in, a, in the marketplace? Well, it can't and it knows it can't. And therefore, it is willing to destroy the world in order to maintain its inefficient economic domination of the world. And I want to underline the use of that word. It is willing to push its inefficient economic domination of the world rather than take some lessons from other people, not only the Chinese, but other people who are producing things perhaps better, cheaper and differently. But you can't, again, drawing from the word Noam uses often, you can't get the godfather to learn new tricks. The godfather's trick is to go to somebody's stable, take their favorite horse, cut off its head and put it in your bed. That's what the Godfather knows. The Godfather doesn't understand how to convince or how to learn. And that, I think, is something young people in the United States. It's a lesson to, to take from this is that learn how to do things better. Learn how to talk to other people. Don't use your muscle to maintain your power because that is bringing the world near destruction or, well, annihilation okay and i'm not a, i'm an optimistic person but i'm afraid for that i'm afraid this attitude is really bringing us to the brink of a war we can't imagine if you like this video from the jacobin show please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends thanks